good sound.
Spread all over the world, and here, look at these newspapers. The Sydney Morning Herald. Uh, I don't know whether you can see it. Signal, the retreat by red scientists. So there it was found out, no, not cities and not extraterrestrials. Or here, the uh, Philadelphia News. U.S. doubts outer space talk. Okay. Yeah. All right. So it was quite some splash from that point of view. Okay, so now we come to, so now we have variability, now we want to come to the radio spectrum. One gigahertz radio spectrum and synchrotron self-absorption intermixed gives very compact objects. Kellerman, Ken Kellerman, 1962, found these radio spectra with very, very strong apparent absorption as it was then explained by Slush. And if you put this together with this formula, this is in milliarc seconds, flux density in Jansky, this is in Gauss, a typical milligauss, 100 milligauss or something like that, one gigahertz, you come up with sizes on the order of 10 milliarc seconds, even one milliarc second. So here's a nice spectrum that was published recently. Okay, so then, this is quite interesting. So this is the third one, the Jordan Bank Microwave Radio Link Interferometer. And there I want to go a little back to the very early stages of interferometry in radio. And that started, as we know, with the sea interferometer in Australia, right after the war. Here, whoever has been in uh, Sydney, beautiful site here at Dover Hills, and there you can actually see the ocean. And uh, um, during the war, this was actually used as radar equipment against the Japanese. But right after the war, what was is now CSIRO, they put up this antenna and then use it as a sea interferometer. So the signal comes in, well, they had to wait for sources that come above the horizon, then actually receive the signal directly, and also the reflected signal had a projected baseline there, and then could, with interference, measure positions of sources. Absolutely fantastic at that time. Bolton, a genius, actually developed this and could actually determine these strong radio sources with several arc minute position accuracy. That was quite something. So that was a C interferometer. In Europe, the development went differently. It <laughs> has also something to do with the war. And uh, this is a Würzburg giant radar that was used by Germany for anti-aircraft radar. And these had beautiful antenna, 7.5 meter diameter, and there were 600 left after the war. Can you imagine? 600 all over Europe. So, you know, I was thinking when I read that, boy, I mean, you could have built actually a little uh, SKA type array already at that time, right? If we had the uh, other technical advances at that time, which wasn't. But nevertheless, these antennas were actually then installed in several observatories, for instance, also Holland. So doing a low, they had this uh, antenna, and they actually observed the hydrogen neutral hydrogen line and to survey with these telescopes. France, and there's a beautiful um, um, uh, account of uh, how these antennas actually um, fostered the development of radio astronomy in Europe at that time. So also Ryle in 1945 got two of these antennas and also two small ones, and then hooked them together and built the first two do two dish interferometer and observed actually fringes from the sun, figured out that the radio emission is not 30 arc minutes. What is 30 arc minutes? Half the tip of my finger, 30 arc minutes, the size of the sun, but rather smaller than 10 arc minutes and could actually conclude that this radio emission is coming from sunspots. Active sun, there we are active sun, interstellar, interplanetary medium in the beginning. And not only that, also the first dual dish interferometry. So Ryle on his way, was on his way to the Nobel Prize, of course, and we were on the way to the LBI, <laughs> if you may uh, put it that way. So, and Smith then actually used this uh, to also determine uh, the positions of uh, these very strong stars, as they were called at that time and uh, had an uh, um, article out in Nature. So now we come to a Gerald Bank. So Gerald Bank actually picked up on these results, and <laughs> Gerald Bank uh, 
When I was a graduate student in Bonn and we had uh, visitors from Jolly Bang, I always admired them about their technological knowledge. And I always envisioned them running around in Jolly Bang, you know, every of these scientists with a soldering iron <laughs> in, <laughs> in their pocket. This is my imagination of a Jolly Bang scientist. <laughs> and from that point of view, it's not surprising that they actually uh, developed microwave interferometry over 100 kilometers, uh, starting with. Um, with uh, Morris, uh, Dave Morris, with whom I had a very good collaboration as a graduate student uh, who came then to Bonn. And uh, so they built these uh, microwave interferometers and, uh, and had baselines of 61,000 lambda. Okay, so then 180,000 lambdas, and then 500,000 lambdas, and even 1 million lambdas over 130 uh, kilometers. So they found fringes, and that, as it's also recorded, was a very important point for the development of UDI. Okay, so, and they found sources, 50 milliard seconds from some extent. So now we come to um, the fourth point. Interplanetary isolation reveals compactness of sources. Okay, so here we have the interplanetary medium, there we have the sun active, all the stuff that flowing through the interplanetary space, density variations, refractive index variations are following, phase changes between waves of different paths, we get interference, and then intensity variations. Okay, so here I have a little sketch. So if we have a point source there, and then at a particular distance, it's a plane wave if there's no medium. Now it comes to the solar wind, it finds all these density enhancements here, refractive indif uh, indexes, and so we have suddenly a distorted wave front, and then we have, well, interference fringes, and that uh, leads to uh, the uh, signal variations that we are studying. Um, the first ones were actually published by Yuish, and the really first observations of these interplanetary simulations was actually done by Margaret Clark, got his PhD in 1964. So here are some, uh, some observations. So lots of simulation there, then not so much simulation a little later. Lots of simulation, not so much, and so on and so on. And it can all be interpreted in terms of the solar wind. So this is, by the way, the solar wind density on the 16th today, October 2017. So we have a very good model of it. So here's the Earth. And if we look this way, as you did, well, lots of fluctua fluctuations. But if you look that way, there's not much fluctuation. So you basically can actually figure out the wind itself. Well, so uh, Martin Cohen, uh, Cohen, Marshall Cohen and Gunderman in 1967 used also this method and came to an absolutely amazing size of smaller than four mi five milliard seconds. But what they did is they actually measured a scintillating <laughs> source very close to the sun. So there's lots of scintillation that they could actually determine this amazing uh, size. Okay, so now it's not far to get actually the pulsars. Pulsar discovery. Jewish first involvement with radio technology was when he worked during the war on airborne radar countermeasure devices. He worked also with Ryle and Jerome's group at the Cavendish Laboratory after the war. And the first assignment was actually the propagation of radiation through inhomogeneous transparent media. Okay, so what is interesting is that he actually, was his first attempt, he secured a funding, funding in the 40, end of 50, uh, in the 50s, uh, no, actually in the 60s, funding for the Interplanetary Simulation Array at the Moyet Radio uh, uh, Astronomy Observatory. And his goal was to study the interplanetary simulation by observing quasars in a grand st uh, style. So we all know this uh, beautiful picture here. They had a time resolution of 0.1 seconds um, in time. Quite amazing how that looks. So here's uh, Jewish and here's Justin Bell, who was a graduate student at the time and uh, helped also to build up the telescope and then was uh, responsible for 
uh, taking the data and looking at the data. And she then actually saw the first sign of a pulsar, as we know, and that is uh, um, uh, recorded uh, very famously here in this first graph. Uh, now, this is also what you find on the internet. This is how it looks today. <laughs> it's amazing, right? This is, uh, was actually an instrument where he got uh, the Nobel Prize. <laughs> It looks a little, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, this is how you can get a Nobel Prize. Okay, so now we go to VLBI, the dawn of VLBI. The radio link engineering success and the scientific results spawned the push to VLBI. And uh, so um, it was pretty clear that uh, for VLBI, very long baseline interferometry, you don't have a radio link, so you actually have to record your data independently at the two stations and have atomic clocks. Now, atomic clocks, if you want to actually put your signal together, let's say one gigahertz, so that's 10 to the 9 hertz, and you want to observe coherently over, let's say, 1,000 seconds, so then you need already... Uh, uh, 10 to the minus 12 uh, frequency accuracy and uh, so if you want to then actually go below, uh, below 2 pi uh, uncertainty then it's on the order of 10 to the minus 13 delta f over f what you need in terms of the stability of a clock that was pretty clear so you also need atomic clocks so and then get a correlator and correlate the data so there were three groups three groups in the world that actually thought seriously about VLBI. There was one in the USSR, and they actually were the first that actually you know, got the idea, wrote a paper after two or three years delay because of pol politics. And uh, so that was Mike Dweigel, Kardashev, the PI of uh, the radio astronaut, and Shomalitsky. And uh, so they say a radio interferometer system without retranslation has been considered, and so on and so on. So then there are two other groups, namely in the U.S. and in Canada, and uh, so they go different ways. Uh, let's see, here we have it. They go different ways. The U.S., 1965, they want to go digital. That was a new thing, 1965, uh, but they had rubidium clocks. So uh, that was not that stable, so they need big antennas, but they had a receiver, of course. So Canada actually wanted to go analog. TV recorders were at that time available, and they had the hydrogen maser. So they actually tried it out on a very short baseline at the ARO, Algonquin Radio Observatory there, for 200 meters or so. It worked. They found fringes. So immediately they took their recorders, went to a Penticton, and recorded data, and that was a baseline over 3,074 3, kilometers, and it correlated. <coughs> Didn't quite work, so they tried other things. In the meantime, the Americans tried out something, but in the effect, they got the fringes out of that baseline and published the first peer-reviewed paper on July 1st, 1967, observations of quasars during interferometry baselines up to 3,074 kilometers. So that was Norm Broughton. And uh, let's see, uh, Yen, Alan Jen here from, uh, from uh, U of T, and um, others. So and then uh, two weeks later, the Americans also came out. So the Canadians and we here in Canada, we are very proud of having published the first paper in VLBI. Although when you read um, reports from the American side, you know, it is not that strongly pronounced that the Canadians actually did it first. <laughs> so I, I thought by looking through the literature, I thought that was quite interesting. Uh, okay, so now we go to VLBI networks in space. So we know we have the VLA here now, beautiful telescopes, works absolutely great. And then we have the European VLBI. Europe is such a small country, but look at the European VLBI network. RSC boys in there. Then Harde Baystoke in South America, all belongs to Europe. And what is this here? Korean Peninsula, you know, China, you name it, uh, Russia, everything is Europe. European VLBI networks, great, great uh, instrument too. Then we come to space VLBI, and the first 
observations were done with TDRS, which is a, an American tracking and data relay satellite. So that is a satellite that actually corresponds from satellite to satellite. Usually it's just satellite to the ground. But these t uh, TDRS satellites, they actually broadcast information on satellite to satellite. And that was out of work, so they actually used this antenna and got fringes, the first fringes in space. Second attempt was with VSOP, and uh, uh, that is the Japanese-led mission for uh, very long baseline interferometry, extending it now to space. And that was a moderately extended orbit, elliptical orbit, about four, four Earth's diameter, so 40,000 kilometers, something like that. But it was great for mapping because this thing actually zoomed around Earth like crazy, and you got a very good, what we call, UV coverage, of course. And um, uh, so beautiful maps were actually made. But the resolution was not what the Russians always had in mind. Early on, Kardashev pushed for a big, big resolution. He always wanted to have a huge baseline. And here is the radio astron, and you see it moves. I made it to move. So, and there we have 350,000 kilometers right now baseline on that uh, particular 10 meter antenna. So that's space VLBI. So now, pulsar scintillometry with VLBI, that's the topic of the conference. Okay, pulsar research exploded in the last 50 years. So we have the 50 year anniversary. Interplanetary and interstellar medium research exploded in the last 50 years. So we have pulsar 50 anniversary of Pulsar. VLBI research re exploded in the last 50 years. So now let's look at the individual parts. What about Pulsar scintillometry? What about Pulsar VLBI? And then what about Pulsar scintillometry with VLBI? Okay, so Pulsar scintillometry. From the interplanetary medium and interstellar medium through DM, Jewish was uh, the first guy who actually, or the first person who actually uh, um, uh, investigated the interstellar medium from the uh, dispersion measure and narrow fluctuations. Um, we uh, got uh, pulsar intensity fluctuations, a theory of the interstellar medium properties, Scheuer, Salpeter, Barney, Rickard, interstellar medium as an interferometer with astronomical unit baseline scale was first actually conceived in the PhD thesis of Lovelace in 1970. Becker used it, and then uh, Jim Cordes in 1983. And here's a picture uh, from uh, Cordes' uh, work, Pulsar, where they actually measured the fluctuations. Do you still remember that, Jim? Yeah? <laughs> yes, <laughs> fluctuations in <and> this, <laughs> this pulse here and that pulse, and they were completely identical. So from that, they actually figured out, with a lot of theory, of course, separation smaller than 1,000 kilometers. That was pretty good. Okay, so pulsar VLBI. All right, that's another combination. Pulsar scintillation, pulsar VLBI. Size smaller than 20 milliarc seconds, scattering disk of pulsar 0329. That was also done with the Canadian VLBI uh, baseline. So we used actually then, the ARO was then actually used for some time. We actually used it uh, for gravity per B astrometry service, and we also used it for supernovae for about 15 years. And now Yuli's uh, group is picking it up and doing pulsar scintillometry with the LBI. <laughs> okay, so this is the first record of uh, pulsar observations with uh, the LBI, and that was 1970. So here we actually tried that was uh, 1985, the Mark III system came up. Mm -hmm. And there we actually figure, tried to figure out the separation of pulsar components by comparing the interferometer phase alone, differential phase. And this is what we got, component two, component one. These are the differential phases. And we found quite some systematics and traced it back to a polarization impurities in the feeds. We modeled these polarization impurities by knowing the pulsar, could get rid of these systematics, and then ended up with component separations of 2 plus minus 7, 26. So if you take everything together, about smaller than 25 micro arc seconds. Okay, so that comes out not 10 to the 3 kilometers, but 9 to 10 to the 6. But 
In that paper, we actually said how we can get an improvement of at least a factor 1,000. Polarization and purity is down, and uh, uh, poles are that is closer. We never did it. Okay, so that is uh, that. And now we come to pulsar scintillometry with VLBI. And uh, the were actually done by uh, Carl. Is Carl here? No? Yes. Carl. So uh, uh, Carl, uh, 1997, and they determined the Vela pulsar region to be smaller or to be about 500 kilometers. We get another result later on. So that's, well. 1997, that's the 20-year anniversary. So we have three anniversaries to celebrate this year. And uh, that's basically all I want to say about that. And we basically will learn about that topic in the next five days. Thank you very much. I don't know how to do it. Can you perhaps sing it for us? <laughs> 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 Okay, um, basically, yes. So uh, we started the VLBI with Pulsar with the Mark III. And the Mark III system is a VLBI system that has 56 megahertz bandwidth in comparison to the Mark II at 2 megahertz bandwidth. So an enormous uh, sensitivity increase. So we could actually measure quite a number of pulsars and then also do fine uh, structure observations. This component separation uh, was basically guided or um, influenced by our work on astrometry, where we measured the phases between uh, um, uh, quasars at the sky and got actually uh, down to about, what is that, uh, 10 micro arc second separation or something like that. So we thought, okay, well, the ideal case is actually a pulsar. You know, what can we, what can we actually reach um, uh, from the purely astrometric um, in, um, observations by comparing the phases. And there we actually saw, well of course we knew that the pulsar the light cylinder, the light cylinder was uh, a thousand times bigger or something like that. Yeah? So we um, did not, with these results, did not really see that we would get closer to it. And we didn't take into account scintillation effects and so on. But we saw what um, uh, technical limitations we had, namely the impurity of the uh, uh, polarizations in the fields. And they were quite good, actually, uh, minus 20 dBs or something like that, minus 23 dBs, they are quite good. So we actually need, we figured out we need actually feeds, which were possible of uh, minus 35 dBs. So it is possible, but it was not available at the time. And uh, then from that pure astrometric aspect, we would actually get down to a to uh, the uh, uh, light cylinder radius with uh, interferometric phases. Yes. Thanks for mentioning, yes, but it was the first observation with this VLBI, but yes, that's right.
So the data when you publish that, that was it was only the body code. However, BLJ was essential for the previous measurements when you were not when you measure the size of the scan ranges to get a critical scale. So BLJ was essential for that implementation, which by the way I think yeah, I see later on had a paper on where I think the back back pedal on that claim and uh, a few years ago was by the Some of those But there was another paper out where he got actually 300 or 200 kilometers, even smaller, um, one year or two years later. Yeah, there's a number of times. Uh, yeah, 2000, 2000, 2001 or so. Which one did you go to? Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Yeah, so the question is, what is the Actually, do you need this? This is actually mine, otherwise. Um, you want it? If I could just have a moment. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Very exciting uh, week. And I'm going to uh, give, uh, give the first introduction to Scintillation Arc Basics. And I'm just putting this uh, slide up here for reference. Uh, and you can refer to some of these papers. And uh, these are some of my key collaborators in this work. And so I wanted to just make a couple of historical remarks at the beginning. And um, how did this idea of scintillation arcs emerge? And um, when, um, uh, so I got my PhD uh, in 1982. I was Jim Cordes's first graduate student. I'm very proud to uh, uh, have uh, uh, been part of the, uh, the, the lineup of PhDs that uh, Jim has supervised. And, um, when we were doing scintillation work back then, the focus was on the autocorrelation function. And so characterizing the size of scintils using two-dimensional autocorrelation functions that would look something like this. And um, a while later, uh, when we knew to uh, focus more on the power spectrum, and uh, this is actually the, exactly the same data. I'll just flip back to this. and so. The grayscale is reversed, but uh, it's the same data. And now, instead of using the autocorrelation function, we're looking at exactly the same information because, of course, the 2D autocorrelation function is just the Fourier transform of the 2D power spectrum. But as is conventional in power spectrum work, we're uh, showing things on a logarithmic grayscale here, and all of a sudden, there's all kinds of interesting uh, information under the surface. But this didn't come out of nowhere. Um, 
In fact, um, Jim Cordes was, was there first, uh, Cordes and Volstan uh, in 1986, and, and work that Jim did uh, earlier than that as well. Um, this is a scintillation arc. It's right there. Okay, this is 1133 plus 16. Um, the axes are flipped around, and, uh, and this uh, is uh, the quadrants are, uh, are scrambled around a bit. But um, this is the structure uh, that we now know of as scintillation arcs. And um, Barney Rickett was also there right from the beginning um, because um, he uh, published this paper in 1997, and it had a very profound effect on me. I, um, I was at um, uh, a meeting, in fact, in January of uh, 2016. I don't know if JP remembers, but um, uh, it was in Sydney, and um, uh, Barney uh, showed this work at that Sydney meeting, and I was astounded because um, he, this tiny little uh, smudge of power out here represented something really uh, gigantic as far as anybody could tell because uh, he definitely showed that this was real because um, there's much more data in the original paper. And uh, their interpretation was spot on, we think. Basically, that there were, uh, uh, were basically two ray paths, two predominant ray paths, a, a direct ray path and a ray path that was sneaking around. And I've forgotten the figure, but I think it was separated by 20 or 30 milli arc seconds um, uh, uh, from the original. And um, again, there's a scintillation arc here, and Barney can help me on this, but I think this is aliased power, and uh, Barney has explained this to me. So this is a contour plot of the same thing, and basically I think this contour plot really belongs over here. And no, no, but oh, you don't, you don't, you don't think that this is uh, is actually curvature connected with the scintillation arc? I think there's an arc there, but it's offset. Okay. So we're gonna, we've got five days, so we can talk of, about a lot of these things. And uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is the work, and um, uh, I love this plot that they have in the paper because um, this also shows just how old-fashioned we were, but of course we were very modern at the time. But um, th at the bottom of this it says, uh, and so Barney is talking here about the fringe pattern which uh, is, is much more visible on the page, um, uh, that is aligned like this and has a spacing like that. And there's this great comment here that says, this can best be seen by tipping the page and looking along the arrow direction. And um, all of us did that, and it really worked, because uh, when, you, when you tipped it, you could see it. And so this is the uh, this is the sort of picture that they had, and uh, again, um, uh, I think it was very prescient and uh, and showed the uh, uh, the crucial effect. <clears throat> so um, in two thousand and one, um, Jim Cordes uh, came down to Arecibo with uh, his graduate student at the time, Moore McLaughlin. And Mora had put together uh, a machine that at least I and many of us just couldn't uh, just couldn't imagine. It was a Fourier transform spectrometer that had all of a thousand channels, and it was very fast, and it could uh, do all the basic things that you want a spectrometer to do. And um, so they were doing their own project with it, but um, uh, we collaborated and. Uh, started looking at pulsars and looking at pulsar scintillation together on that. And we, were, we started to see these patterns in a whole bunch of pulsars. And so this was the dynamic spectrum that we were looking at. And then, uh, again, displaying it the way we were displaying it back then. Um, these things, I remember in, in our lab at Oberlin, we called these palm fronds. And so these were the palm fronds that, uh, uh, that would show up. And we didn't know what they were. But um, we kept looking and kept looking. And um, in 2001, we published this paper that had um, palm fronds 
every place and um, sprouting out. Uh, we could even see little hints of it here and little hints of it here. <clears throat> and um, this is somewhat relevant to um, work that um, I'm doing with students right now. Uh, students in the room, Stella Ocker and I. Uh, Stella will be uh, talking about similar sort of cross-cut plots on Wednesday, but um, we talk about how we stitched things together and did uh, cuts across and, and saw these kind of ridge lines uh, lined up like this. And, um, that was, uh, that was really very exciting. And I also remember, and I, I haven't had a chance to check this detail with, um, with Jim Cordes, but um, here we go. Um, but I remember uh, we were playing around with this, and of course we were very, very excited, and we, you know, we uh, thought, thought that there was something um, just fascinating here. And, and Jim came in one day, and they weren't palm fronds anymore. Uh, it was a uh, uh, it was a parabola, and uh, he had just he had just changed the symmetry of the uh, of the diagram, and instead of looking at this and this, we were you know we were looking at um, uh, that uh, upper half plane, and all of a sudden uh, it was uh, you know uh, a simple parabola. So anyway, that was a bit of history, and um, let me just uh, give you some idea of uh, uh, some real scintillation arc basics. And fortunately, I've had a chance to see Barney Ricketts' slides, and I know that he's going into this in more detail and uh, has, has very nice treatment. Um, so um, I'm mostly going to be showing pretty pictures. Um, and Barney uh, will have uh, some wonderful details to follow on. So just some uh, grounding for those of you who are new to this area. So this is what we call the dynamic or primary spectrum, um, oftentimes displayed with radio frequency here and time here. And then if you have adequate frequency resolution and good time resolution, you take the 2, 2D uh, power spectrum of that and uh, and you get all kinds of beautiful uh, structure underneath. Notice that this is displayed logarithmically. And um, here's just a very schematic picture of um, uh, what uh, many of us think is going on. And so uh, we're talking about something like a kiloparsec to a typical pulsar, something like a 10 milliarc second scattering disk size at uh, uh, you know, um, 400 to uh, 1400 um, megahertz radio frequencies, and um, and so you get a random diffraction pattern here at uh, in the vicinity of the Earth, and then the fact that there's motion in the problem is what makes this a dynamic spectrum rather than just a frozen in kind of spectrum, <clears throat> and uh, roughly speaking. We still think that the basic idea here is that there, there needs to be some kind of relatively sharp pencil-like beam. Don't take that too literally. This is uh, in typically not a unscattered component of uh, the pulsar emission, but instead some kind of scatter-broadened core of emission. But if that's all you had, in fact, um, you would not get much of a scintillation arc because, um, for example, a Gaussian scattering beam uh, cuts off so sharply that uh, there's, there's just um, nothing, nothing out in the wings to interfere with. So some kind of a core with some sort of an extended halo. And um, I want to emphasize that what really also drives the scintillation arcs is some kind of strong correspondence between the time delay of the signal and the angle of arrival. And that's something that you get if you have, uh, if you have a, I'm sorry that this is a bad angle for a lot of people, but <clears throat> if you have a scattering screen like so, I'm going to have other pictures like this, but if you have a scattering screen, 
you will get a, in this case, a one-to-one -one relationship between the extra time delay that a ray path takes and the angle that it comes in at. <clears throat> and uh, this is a picture that uh, Jim Cordes uh, uh, produced, and so this is showing what I just mentioned there. And by contrast, if we're talking about scattering in the extended interstellar medium, which many of us do believe in at, at uh, some level, that um, strong correspondence between extra time delay and angle of arrival uh, uh, doesn't exist in that, uh, at least in that very well-developed uh, fashion. <clears throat> okay, I, let me just, uh, okay. Um, I just want to quickly, for um, again, for people who are new to this um, in the room, I think there's a very simple way to understand the two axes on the secondary spectrum. This doesn't get all of the um, screen placement factors correct, but it gets the basic physics correct. So um, this is a, a simple uh, Young's uh, double slit experiment. Just imagine two point sources on the sky, two um, uh, two spots on the image of the pulsar, well, um, coming from the pulsar, it's going to set up a fringe pattern, as uh, Norbert uh, so beautifully uh, illustrated. And anyway, when you work through the geometry, so you've got a fringe pattern here, but now it's moving. Uh, there's motion in the problem. And so if you take this physical size and divide it by a relevant velocity, <clears throat> um, I'll just thumb through this, if you divide it by a relevant velocity, you get a time for modulation of the signal that will be lambda over v theta, where theta is now the angle of, the, um, of these two sources on the sky as viewed from the observer. But the uh, conjugate time axis on the uh, typical secondary spectrum is just the uh, reciprocal of that uh, uh, modulation time. And so here's f sub, f sub t equals v theta over lambda, which is the basic physics. Likewise, the basic physics for the time delay is, um, is also very straightforward, e even easier to think about. Now we have two ray paths. We have a, a simple little extra um, arrival time there, and this is, uh, and so this is the extra time delay, very well-known formula. But it's also well-known for any, particularly anybody who's done any kind of engineering work, if you have one cable that's carrying a signal and another cable that's carrying a signal, but that other cable that's carrying the signal has a time delay, it will set up a modulation in your, in the spectrum uh, and the modulation in the spectrum has a, uh, a frequency scale that I'm calling delta nu here, and it's, there's basically an uncertainty relationship um, that, is, uh, <clears throat> that is setting up that interference pattern. And the period of that is given by this expression, and then when we take the reciprocal of that, we've got d theta squared um, over c. And so that's, again, the basic physics. And then the basic uh, um, parabolic arc, and um, this was understood by, uh, certainly in 2004, 2006, um, uh, paper that uh, Jim led um, from our group, and then Mark Walker was also doing very pioneering and important work um, at the same time. And uh, anyway, you can put these things together and you've got, uh, here's your parabolic arcs. Details, uh, 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 Barney will be showing us more details. Some really lovely work by Mark Walker that um, <clears throat> uh, explains very clearly, um, at least to my mind, where these inverted arclets come from. He just took a, uh, uh, just as a toy model, he just took a one-dimensional distribution here just a series of point sources, 
and did all of the mutual interferences um, between them and put them down in the secondary spectrum where they belong. And for example, this point interfering with all the other points in the, um, <clears throat> uh, along this line source will give you this inverted arclet, uh, this point uh, interfering with all the other uh, point sources in this line uh, lineup will uh, give you that inverted arclet and so on for all of those other inverted arclets. And again, Barney will be uh, showing some very nice uh, examples and, and elaborating on this some more. Now, um, uh, only a few of you have been in, have had this inflicted um, on you uh, before, but um, uh, one of the things that we were quite interested in was when we would see this kind of inverted arclet structure. Was this um, was this some kind of speckle phenomenon that would disappear very rapidly, or was it uh, something persistent? And um, one of my uh, favorite papers and favorite projects uh, from, from our efforts, uh, I don't think I can tap into the, um, for some reason I decided to put uh, sitar music uh, to this. But um, over 25 days, we were able to see these, um, uh, these arclets Four of them move upward in a systematic way um, uh, along the um, uh, that parabola, and let's hope I can stop this. And when we analyze that in terms of milliarc seconds on the sky versus 25 days, we actually got a um, proper motion of 51 plus or minus one milliarc second. Uh, per year, which agrees very well with the VLBI um, uh, uh, result that's sort of three years and uh, uh, telescopes around the globe. And this was um, uh, all done with the Arecibo telescope. Now that work, I'll just mention to the students in the room, that work has not been followed up on in any serious way. It hasn't been tried on any other pulsars. There's, I think there's uh, exciting work to do uh, just uh, single, uh, single dish work that could be done similarly to this. And so as I mentioned before, the, um, um, a Gaussian, uh, this is actually a Gaussian um, on the sky, but now this is logarithmic power uh, going downward here, and this is linear in uh, angle. And so a Gaussian is a parabola in this representation. And the point is it's cutting off very sharply with angle. And this is, uh, if you have Kolmogorov turbulence in um, a medium and shine uh, some kind of a radio beam through it, you can calculate um, uh, the sort of wing, wings in the scattering that you expect. And they give uh, these much broader wings. So just a couple of other highlights, um, uh, things that uh, I've particularly enjoyed, projects that, uh, that we've explored. But really, the emphasis here is there's so much good work to do. There's so much. You can get great data in a hurry with a big telescope and do very nice projects quickly. This is really, um, uh, there, there's uh, all kinds of openings. Uh, for new students and, uh, and researchers. And this is basically just telling us uh, Barney and uh, um, Jim Cordes uh, show in this paper how to combine the pulsar velocity with the Earth motion and any kind of screen location. And that affects the um, arc curvature. And um, <clears throat> we showed for uh, this pulsar 1929 plus 10, that when we look over the uh, over a year, you can see the modulation of the Earth's motion, and in fact, we um, we believe that we have pinned down um, the location of the scattering screen 
actually quite precisely uh, with these data. Again, this kind of looking for the modulation um, of the Earth's motion in various uh, scintillation arc observations, again, I think is something that uh, could really be followed up on. Also, one of the things that, that you're going to be seeing all week long is, in fact, um, scintillation arcs are oftentimes multiple. And um, this is a favorite pulsar of ours for scintillation arc studies, 1133 plus 16. Um, and so here are multiple scintillation arcs. And um, uh, when you work this through, we actually have found four persistent arcs. This was uh, work we published in 2006 when we had about 25 uh, years worth of data. But we've recently done a uh, substantial campaign on this pulsar. And um, I will comment on this in just a moment um, because I do want to note the fact that this assumes that if there is a linear structure on the sky, which I uh, strongly expect there is from work that Wei Li and others have pointed us to. Um, so if we have some kind of a bar-like structure on the sky, pulsar here, and the velocity vector like this, there's an additional angle in the problem that I'll call psi. And that um, changes the location of these uh, scattering screens in this analysis, but it always moves them toward the pulsar. The way it works is that any non-zero psi will move these toward the pulsar. And in fact, you could arrange it such that all of them could, for example, be located right there, but with different psi values. Here's uh, 35, wor 35 years worth of data. And um, we may show more of this uh, uh, on Wednesday. <clears throat> and we did this for a variety of pulsars where we saw multiple scattering screens. And I won't dwell on this because I think there's um, a lot to think about in connection with these placements of the screens. But again, this important caveat that in the work that we did earlier, we didn't fully appreciate the presence of this extra angle psi that, um, that moved, potentially moves the screens um, uh, toward the pulsar. So one of the themes that I have uh, tried to emphasize um, for a bunch of years is that I think uh, the scintillation arcs underlie a lot of uh, scintillation patterns that, um, uh, that we have historically focused on. And I don't think this is all that controversial at the moment, but I do want to do um, a couple of um, pairs of blinking between um, epics. And so in this case, um, in the good old days, we would have described this as a tilted scintle phenomenon that Anthony Hewish and others des uh, described in terms of a, um, a big refractive wedge in the uh, interstellar medium. And um, a little bit later, a year later, you can see that, that there's a scintillation arc uh, lurking underneath that. And by the way, the uh, um, resolution and the, uh, uh, the, the data taking is set up in exactly the same way. Here's another pair. Okay, and so this, again, tilted scintles here, strong refractive effect. Well, yes, I think that's part of what's going on. But then you go ahead and you look at another epic and um, there's, a scintillation, there's a scintillation arc there. And it's just uh, um, one-sided at one epoch, but two-sided at the other epoch. One more example. Here is, again, um, an overall tilt pattern to the scintils that you would pick up in an autocorrelation function analysis. You go ahead, though, and look at that at a different epoch. And there is the, um, whoops, and there's the scintil. Excuse me, there's the scintillation arc. One final example, and this one I find extraordinarily interesting because um, 
when I was learning about all this stuff, I, I can remember asking Jim, well, what does a scintle look like and what is a scintle? And he tried to patiently explain to me that it was a random process and that you, uh, you, know, you couldn't always necessarily draw a, uh, a circle around one. But anyway, these are lots of good scintles. When you take these data and look at the secondary spectrum, you get this big cloud of power. And that's, um, that made complete sense to us because uh, we think about this is a very distant pulsar, very high DM pulsar, thought about a lot of scattering along the line of sight, um, uh, a big scatter broadened disk. Notice that this we had 20 megahertz of bandwidth here, which is not extraordinary, but, um, but, uh, but I'll show you a comparison in just a second. So this is 20 megahertz of bandwidth, but let's say that instead of 20 megahertz of bandwidth, you have one megahertz of bandwidth. If you have one megahertz of bandwidth um, uh, at nearly the same epoch, um, you, are, you are seeing these tilted scintils. This is the central scatter broadened region. These are, um, uh, <coughs> these are other patches of low level power that um, I have no doubt are related to some kind of a scintillation arc there. As I was preparing this talk, it took me back through some uh, data that, uh, that we've worked with and I've shown before, and it just um, uh, continues to delight me. I want to note the fact that if you go back to that heuristic derivation for um, the scattering delay, you remember that that is independent of observing wavelength. So let's take a look at this. And let's look at this pulsar 0834 plus 06. And here we are at 400 megahertz. And we're going out to a delay of 50 microseconds. And so this is um, this big one-sided scintillation arc um, going out to 50 microseconds. <clears throat> this at 1.1 gigahertz we're going out to only one-tenth the, um, uh, the delay, and, um, and, we've got, um, uh, and we've got a chairman who is standing up, and so we need to move along. And, um, and, and so we've got this, this kind of uh, feature down here. And um, what I want to point to is we, we also had observations up to 2.2 gigahertz, and now we're zooming in on this. And this is really, to me, this is reminiscent of the way that VLBI, um, you, you, you look at these um, quasar jets, and you look at the quasar jets on, so I'm quite serious about this, on the very large scales. And then you continue to zoom in. And, and um, as you get to the smaller and smaller scales, you're seeing a central engine, you know, some kind of central pattern that is self-similar as you go down to smaller and smaller scales. Um, I took this and I just used PowerPoint to squish it down by a factor of 10. And that's what it looks like. And then at the 2.2 gigahertz, it goes down by another uh, factor. And it's that small little thing lying underneath um, the bigger structure. I think I, in fairness to others, I need to um, jump to my concluding remarks. And um, I, uh, I have a few more minutes on, um, on Wednesday to share some of these things with you. There's a scientific um, honor society called Sigma Psi that their motto is companions in zealous re research. And I have been very fortunate to have some wonderful companions in zealous research. And um, one of them is Barney Rickett, uh, seen here in a slightly um, earlier uh, phase of his uh, uh, scientific life. Uh, and um, on the same sailing trip, which unfortunately I was not on, um, here's uh, Jim Cordes and Tim Hankins. Uh, 
also uh, um, adding to the frontiers of uh, uh, pulsar knowledge uh, down in the crew. Studying the waves, exactly. And finally, um, uh, a more recent uh, collaborator and uh, uh, scientific friend is Whaley Penn, who has really opened up a lot of new avenues in this area. And uh, this, uh, uh, this Toronto skyline picture uh, really opened up a, a, a lot of ideas uh, uh, for me and for others in thinking about uh, what's going on with scintillation arcs. And we will um, uh, have more to say about that and more to think about in, uh, uh, over the next uh, five days. And I just, again, say for the students and the uh, younger researchers in the group, there's a, a ton of good work to do here. And uh, I'm very excited to uh, um, looking forward to uh, all the fun ahead. So thank you very much. Yeah. Um, uh, no, I didn't mean it that way, although I, uh, I can certainly see how um, uh, it's not that there's too much bandwidth. It's the, there's not enough frequency resolution. So in other words, if you, if you had this bandwidth, but you were then able to, to um, get the same frequency resolution that you have here so that then you um, would go up to that in delay, then I'm sure that you would, you would see it. But it's a very interesting question because the interplay between the sort of field of view that you're looking at in your dynamic spectrum and the kind of resolution that you have, it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting in terms of thinking about looking at the scattering from thin screens compared to the extended medium. Yeah. Not with you on that. I'm going to have to. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to talk about that, but I don't quite catch your question. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Do you have do you have your own connector in your own Okay, I have one, but I Nor Norbert needs this one. Well enough? Yeah. Okay, come on. So
Here we go. Time to get rid of that. Oh, it's Ken. Yeah. Yeah, right. Turn off Wi Fi. Except I'm not seeing the damn Wi Fi. Oh dear. Sorry about this. It's just the typical laptop dance. It really wants me to be online, and I don't want to be online. Okay, so uh, I thank the organizers for inviting me here, and um, I find myself in a giving part of an introduction, which I wasn't really anticipating doing a few days ago, um, but I'm going to follow up what Dan has done um, in giving some more details about scintillation arcs, and I'm fascinated by the relationship between the secondary spectrum which is the domain of the scintillation arcs, and the scattered brightness distribution. So um, when Dan, I have to make a little praise here to Jim and Dan who discovered scintillation arcs. That just blew my mind. I've been working in scintillation for a couple, two or three decades and had not seen this phenomenon. Um, so it was very exciting. And then when Jim and Alex Hill and other students published this one, I really uh, was fascinated and puzzled. So remind you, this is the primary spectrum. I call it S1 and the secondary spectrum, S2. And um, the, th the thing that's present here is both the forward parabola. You can see you're following, I put in a dotted parabola and it lies nicely. And then these, that's the main forward arc and then the reverse arclets are the little upturned things. Uh, it says two things. The medium is very anisotropic and I'll get more about, to talk more about that. But it's also very lumpy. I mean these things come from different locations or from different angles. And in fact, there must be something at the center. Dan would refer to it as a core, uh, because it's very different from a, an emitting AGN or something which has a core emission um, and blobs of emission further out. Those are not coherent with each other. In an AGN, uh, it's incoherent emission from each point. In scattering, there's coherence between every point on the brightness distribution. And in fact, it's the distribution, it's the interference of two rays. So we talk about this in the ray term. Uh, waves arrive from two angles with a d different delay and a different offset in frequency. And here's the theta squared, as Dan showed us. And this term here can be thought of as the relative Doppler shift because uh, there's a motion between this point here and the observer, and there's a component of that along the line of sight. Sine of that angle gives you the V dot theta um, in the Doppler shift. So I call it the Doppler shift. Um, so these two terms interfere. Put this in, you get, uh, basically you get fringes in frequency and time. If you Fourier transform those, you get two dots. So a, a pair of angles give you a, a 
point in the secondary spectrum. So I call this S2 and then S1. So that'll be my notation. Um, and uh, particularly when one of the angles is zero, then you put zero into theta two, say. Um, you can put theta one x then into here. You get a parabolic result. You get a quadratic result, not a parabola. You get a quadratic relation between tau and fd, which does also depend on theta one y. Now I'm using the x direction along the velocity. Um, that's clear here, I think. This is v dot theta. And I've said the velocity direction is the x-axis. And so that takes into account the angle that uh, Dan had mentioned over here. If theta 1 lies in a straight line, that is one dimensional scattering, some angle there, then uh, the relationship is a parabola through the origin. Now I'm going to illustrate that with some of Dan's beautiful data from this pulsar. Here are these reverse arclets. And if you think about each one of these, it goes along and comes down through the origin. This one comes down and goes through the origin. Uh, of course, this is, we've lost the other quadrant, which is the same thing, but flipped about the axis. So these arclets, their tail from, turns up over here. So those are part of the parabolas. But in general, the secondary spectrum has to sum all of the pairs of angles. Why just two? No, we can't. There is a distribution. So at the gym, I think I wrote down this equation first. Um, you've got to sum all of the pairs. So you write as an integral. You've got to constrain it so that uh, the pairs go through the point of delay and Doppler. And that's taken care of with the delta functions. And so that is a, a general enough equation for um, the relationship. If the brightness distribution is one dimensional and oriented at, at an angle alpha, I've called it here, to the velocity vector, then you get a much simpler result you get that the secondary spectrum is the product of the brightness at the two angles. And the two angles are given uniquely in terms of the delay and Doppler shift for that point you're considering. Uh, the curvature parameter has to involve this angle, uh, which I'm calling alpha. So I mean, if, you, if you take an observation of the secondary spectrum <clears throat> and, and you make the bold assumption that it's a one-dimensional distribution, then you can simply fit the model and estimate the brightness distribution. Of course, you need these uh, constants. So I'm now going to turn the problem around the other way. That is, um, if we know the brightness distribution, um, what is the secondary spectrum? Um, okay, so this is a little bit complicated. <coughs> We've got um, an axial ratio of 3 to 1 and 10 to 1. This is for Kolmogorov spectrum. So we're assuming a screen. So the scattering is located in the screen. It, the spatial distribution in the screen of electron density follows a Kolmogorov uh, law which is anisotropic, it has a, an axial ratio of here 3 to 1 and 10 to 1. And, and there's another parameter in here. There are two more parameters. One is the strength of scattering, which I've characterized by what I call MB squared. That's the Born approximation with the scintillation net index squared. <laughs> um, so this is weak scintillation, and this is right at the peak of the scintillation index curve. And very many pulsar observations are 
with this mb squared of 10, 50. I can't use this computer code for such high values, but we can use it very precisely. This is um, simulations from a code written by uh, Bill Coles, my colleague and friend, and his former student. Um, the third parameter is the angle alpha between the velocity axis and the scattering. So this is 30 degrees, uh, sorry, zero degrees, 30 degrees, 60 degrees. And what do you see here? You see changing form. Um, this is a very anisotropic uh, um, brightness function, very nice forward arc very thin. What do we notice if we go to a lower axial ratio? It gets less thin. It gets fuzzy. It gets a filled arc, but it's got a sharp outer edge. Um, incidentally, this uh, parameter varies with the wavelength, a little bit sh steeper than um, wavelength. So as you go to longer wavelengths, and one meter is well down much further here, typically. Um, these are longer wavelengths than this. Um, OK, so that. Here it is again. And I want to zoom in on um, this guy, I think it is. No, I'm sorry, it's that guy. Um, that's a nice filled interior arc, and then I'm going to zoom in on the other one. This is 10 to 1, but at the same strength of scattering. So you can see that as you go from uh, sort of uh, anisotropy to greater anisotropy, you get a sharper arc. Um, if you go to stronger scattering, this is the mb squared up to 1, the arc tends starts to come out of its boundary. It spills out. It, it's no longer, sorry, no longer sharply <coughs> bounded. And that's the beginning of strong scattering. And as you take this to very strong scattering, the whole thing blurs out into a much fuzzier. And I should have, I should have put some simulations in of that, but I'm so obsessed in finding these nice arcs that I tend to tweak the parameters towards the arcs rather than uh, the uninteresting cases when they don't show. So the idea of, so this is in the forward direction, taking the assumed Kolmogorov brightness to estimate the secondary spectrum. What about going the other way? Well, I made a, a stab at this with a student. Um, this is uh, 10 years ago, I guess. So these were observations taken back in um, the 80s of the Pulsar 1133. And you can just about see some reverse arclets on two subsequent days, and then they disappeared. And we tried to invert that and came with a um, linear, that is very anisotropic, lumpy uh, brightness distribution, and also asymmetrical. It's not centered. And that, of course, accounts for the fact it's one-sided here. The, the, um, the <coughs> color table there is logarithmic. In yes, it is. Um, and it's not, tab not given. Um, these were early observations in this business. Um, <coughs> then here's the modern version of that, which is a very uh, sophisticated experiment that Walter Briskin uh, came to Bill and I in San Diego, and he said, I want to do the OBI of the arcs. And uh, we said, well, you, that's great, but the chance of doing that and finding reverse arclets is really kind of unreasonable. But let's give it a try. And wow, did he ever succeed. So this is the, these are logarithmic uh, scales. And here's the reverse arclets um, from the 0834. This is the Green Bank to Arecibo visibility. And the phase in those is uh, clearly very systematic. And um, 
I'll just give you the mathematics of this phase. You've got a baseline, and you've got um, waves coming in from two directions, theta 1, theta 2. The phase is given by the average position of those two angles of arrival, theta 1 plus theta 2 over 2, dotted into the baseline. That's it. And that agrees beautifully with this and allows you to get the, um, when you go to the peak of the arclet, one of the angles is zero. So in that case, the phase gives you the astrometric position, astrometric position of the other one. So that's really a lovely result. Um, there's a particularly interesting feature out at one millisecond delay. Um, my graduate student, J.J. Gao, um, was involved in the analysis of all of this, and he put together this, made this image from the observations, and um, he allowed the location of this uh, to wander in off this main axis. And this, this is the constructed image. You can't see it, but there's a little faint thing about here in the color table, uh, which is the one millisecond feature. Um, okay, so now onto the reverse arclets themselves. I've been obsessed with trying to fit them with a one-dimensional model. So here is the d observations I showed you already. And here's a 1D uh, model fit to it. And you can see the main, I, oops. The main features uh, are really nicely represented. This thing picks up. Um, look in the V-shaped region here. That's where things don't work so well. The model gives you nothing in that region, but there is something. But, and what, the, what that's about is the degree of anisotropy. Um, here's the angular, the B of theta um, function along its axis on a logarithmic, on a dB plot. Um, these are the islands that produce the arclets. This is the peak in the middle. It's not quite central because this is tilts to the result. And Dan, as he said on this um, pulsar, measured it every day or many days for about three weeks, 25 days. And I fitted the brightness distribution each day. And I was hoping to find um, these things moving fixed. Um, it's like a VLBI project with a uh, moving ejector from a source. Yeah, <laughs> 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 ah, there you are. <laughs> um, evidently, these things are changing as they move. They are moving somewhat, but you can split the data into two halves and look for a change between in a, an hour. And I couldn't see much of that either. Um, and so here are two cartoons. Um, this is what I call sort of spaghetti, the perpendicular geometry. If it were going through highly anisotropic scattering regions, they will scatter more at right angles to the narrow dimension. That would create a one-dimensional or very anisotropic scattering. Or it could be that the turbulence, if it is turbulence, or the refraction is localized very precisely in a very narrow piece of the sky. Um, this is what is needed for the one millisecond feature. And uh, Wei Li and his students have done some interesting work to show that that's due to a second screen. Um, but you, well, I'll, you know, you, is, is there some chance that your, your pulsar is behind this rather than this? 
it says these structures are very widespread. But I want to move on and talk about the forward arcs. So here's 1133, um, fairly recently at 1400 megahertz. And you can see it has a nice forward arc. And so I can, again, fit the one-dimensional model to that. Uh, and you can see, well, it's not that good. But that's the best I could do for the 1D model. <clears throat> On the same time, this is at 1400 megahertz. He had taken data at um, 432. And here you see the arc is much wider. The scattering gets stronger. That is, this MV squared gets larger. The brightness function widens out. And uh, the strength of the component of the center, which is to get a forward arc, you've got to have interference between an unscattered component and the rest of the material. Um, if there's simply a big range of angles, they've all got to interfere with each other. And that comes in, that's what broadens out this arc. So again, I fitted a, m a model to that, a 1D model. Um, and look in the central V region here. There's significant power in there, which is not modeled here. It needs a two-dimensional model for the brightness distribution, not a 1D model. But this works reasonably well. Um, here, the red curve is the 1450 megahertz brightness function, and the black curve is the one at 430 megahertz. And I'm interested in the wavelength scaling of this brightness, of this width. And we go from 1400 to 432. And I've got a simple, uh, the green curve is a scaling as, as lambda. I've taken the red curve and widened it by the ratio of the wavelengths. The bluish curve is widening it by lambda squared. And it lies in between, say, lambda to the 1.8. That's not what we expect from uh, random Kolmogorov scattering. We expect 2.2, if it were literally the Kolmogorov model. Um, this is a plot of the dark blue curve. is a plot of the nominal, the approximation to the Kolmogorov model there. Eh, it's a, not, not particularly convincing, I don't think. Um, to go back then to these arclets, remember you, uh, Dan showed you these. I was amazed by this result. These are at two different frequencies. And we lost the key here. Where is it? Um, 334 and 321. Um, the bottom line here is that the prediction if the angle was independent of wavelength, it would be this line here. And if they were showing refraction, plasma refraction, they would be down here. It's clear that they, the angles in the sky are wavelength independent. So that's the reverse arclets. They're coming from little points out here which are independent of wavelength. But the broad distribution along the line is wavelength dependent. And it's putting those together that I am sort of obsessed with at the moment. And I, I haven't succeeded, I think, is the answer. Here is the brightness distribution at three frequencies, three wavelengths, if you like, from the Kolmogorov theory. And this is the wavelength of the lambda, the 2.2. And uh, this disagrees with the estimation that I made from the data. Um, what about lensing models? Well, I've gone through the process of making a lens and computing its dynamic spectrum using the same code that um, I mentioned earlier. That is, it's a screen simulation. And I put uh, one of um, a, a, an approximation of the SIMARD 
and Penn. I think Dana Simard is are she here? Oh, that's too bad. Um, so I've coded that into a, uh, and these are the angular distributions. Now, how on earth do you characterize the width of that thing? I've got to characterize it and see how it changes with wavelength. But the real problem is that it changes shape. These are not simply expanded versions. Um, and that thereby sort of hangs a tail. So I think I'll end at that point. Well, something is changing. Um, <laughs> whatever the something is that's causing these outlets. I mean, the, the pulsar is moving through this medium, isn't it? Um, and you'd expect to see this outlet causing region is stable for the duration of the observation. You'd expect to see it picked up. And then one of the beautiful things about Dan's observations of 0834 was that they were stable. And he saw them over 20 odd days. But for 1737, that's not the case. So I, I don't know the answer. Maybe I can just clarify that a little bit. Um, uh, because actually that 1737 observation was once per week. So we had about 20 epochs, but they're a once good, per week. Good point. And, so and, and I don't even remember the velocity. We need to look at the velocity. Yeah, I didn't. So you're, you're, you're moving across many AU in this, uh, or several AU, I should say. Just to say I mean, there, there's, there are distributions in the line of sight, along the line of sight, uh, and they can sort of overlap each other and confuse each other by um, the multiple, a path can go through two deviating screens in the way that um, Wayne has suggested, in fact. Um, let's take some questions in the back. JP? Tell you something about the underlying assumptions of 
I mean, I, in, in my point of view is that there's more than the, the derivative of the phase and the second derivative of the phase. You're estimating a, a distribution of angles of arrival. Um, if you want to make it up out of point sources which have particular, I mean, you can construct a brightness distribution from an array of point scatterers, if you like, which I think is the Mark Walker uh, model. Um, but but there's, it's not just one derivative of the phase. That would just be a shift in, in uh, position. Right, but you got measurement of the, in the cross of phi and U. So uh, in the Walker model, for example, you would have measurement of the phi and U and the curvature at every one of the sections. Um, so the question is, can you theoretically, can you put together a coherent picture of the phase across the phi and U? Well, I mean, if, if you're... There you're invoking refraction as the cause of the phase derivative, aren't you? Uh, no. Because in the, 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 for example, in the station of phase model, it is, a, it is a diffractive model, but it is still correct to talk about the magnification of those points of sun rays. Right? Yeah, let me get Thomas here just because I think he's getting late. And he's looking at technical. And yes. And this is what he's doing. Yeah. Um, and Martin also. Let's have Martin. Uh, it's, uh, it's more of a comment. I like your, your thing that the one dimensional might, might be breaking down, but this uh, is a football basically wants to reiterate that there is a very deep. That, that means one of your assumptions breaks down. Either you're not one dimensional or you, don't, you no longer have the same experience. Yeah. Yeah, and Jim? I was going to ask that question more. So in your model, you have you indicated you have a dearth of power that arose. Yes. Right, and it, and it looked like you weren't even seeing the central piece of the region being changed. Has that been removed from the problem? Well, the, the because the one view was just not truly at the origin. The <coughs> the the. Um, <coughs> well, I mean, in the secondary spectrum, there's a point at the origin, which yeah, is, is which I have removed because ah. it, it responds to the mean right. squared power. Right. And it has uh, a tremendous leakage problem. Mm -hmm. That is, from a spectral estimation point of view, you, you, uh, it can leak into the spectrum using the window function. Right. Yeah. No. Right. So that's not there. Yeah. In the model. Well, it um, and it's in the observations. It's very faint. Well, no, but I thought I could see it. In okay. Yeah. I mean, so. Yeah. I mean, th th that's where we've got to go yeah. in this process. I think. Thank you. 